Hello and welcome to today's niche webinar, Oral Health and an Overview for Older Adults. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Erin Hartnett. She is the Program Director for the NYU College of Nursing's Oral Health Programs, Oral Health Nursing Education and Practice, and Teaching Oral Systematic Health. Dr. Hartnett is a pe pediatric nurse practitioner. She is developing an interprofessional oral health curriculum with NYU Nursing, Medical, and Dental Schools. She is a consultant for many colleges and universities who are developing interprofessional oral health programs. Dr. Hartnett is involved in promoting oral health in the community as a member of the New York City Department of Health Oral Health Task Force. She coordinated an oral health education program for the New York City Nurse Family Partnership staff, which is now being offered nationally. She is also working closely with American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry on a study of oral health in primary care. Dr. Hartnett, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Okay. All right. I'm sorry about that. We couldn't get the slide up. Um, so almost 15 years have passed since the U.S. Surgeon General David Satcher's landmark report, Oral Health in America, which referred to the mouth as a mirror of the body, and it served as a call to action for all health professionals to play a role in reducing the burden of oral disease in America. This report highlighted the disparities in our oral health care, but yet it didn't gain much traction over the years in terms of oral health advocacy or increasing the workforce capacity. So a decade later, in 2011, the Institute of Medicine issued three more reports on oral health, Advancing Oral Health in America, improving access to oral health for vulnerable and underserved populations, and oral health literacy. These all reinforced the importance of oral health and highlighted the centrality of the nursing profession in improving oral health outcomes. One of the IOM recommendations was to invest in workforce innovations to improve oral health. These workforce innovations were to focus on core competency development, education, and training so that all health professionals could contribute to oral health care. The IOM's vision for oral health care is for everyone to have access to quality oral health care across the life cycle. Although these reports recommended integrating oral health into overall health care, Throughout much of our healthcare system, oral health is still treated as a separate entity in the health professions education, service delivery, and the financing of healthcare. And our goal is to change that. So Healthy People 2020 has made oral health one of its top leading health indicators. This clearly shows how important oral health is in relation to overall health. And the Healthy People 2020 goals for oral health in the older adult are to reduce decay, caries, extractions, and periodontal disease in older adults, and to increase earlier detection of oral cancer, to increase tobacco cessation programs, and glycemic testing for oral adults, older adults. So let's look at the oral health disparities, the access, and the consequences for the older adult. We have many, many oral health disparities in the U.S., especially in our most vulnerable populations, the poor, the minorities, the children, the ill, and the elderly. The older adult population is the fastest growing population, and by 2013, there will be 72 million older adults, and most of these won't have access to dental care. Why? Because there are many, many barriers for, dental, for access to dental care for the elderly. The first is insurance. Insurance coverage is very limited, 70% of older adults do not have any dental coverage because dental care is not included in Medicare. 
And as far as Medicaid goes, only half the states that have an adult have an adult Medicaid dental benefit. And many of those adults may have trouble finding a dentist who accepts Medicaid. There is also an oral health literacy problem. Many of the older adults do not really understand or know that they are supposed to be seeing a dentist, and they haven't seen one in five years. And many older adults really lack the ability to pay. Many of these are retirees. They may have had dental coverage when they were working, but now they're faced with out-of-pocket costs, and they have few resources. They're often on a limited and fixed income. And then access to care is an issue for older adults. Many live in areas where dentists are scarce, many of the rural settings, and others do not have the transportation needed to get to dental care. So their poor oral health and their lack of access to care will cause increased health issues because of the oral systemic connection. We look at how many older adults lose their teeth. They often complain of loose teeth and can't chew. They can't enjoy their meals. They suffer nutritional deficiencies because of this. And then with the loss of their teeth, they also can lose self-esteem, have difficulty with communication, and socialization. Many adults have gum disease, which are related to systemic diseases like diabetes and heart disease. 50% have untreated caries. This can cause, this is an untreated oral infection, can spread into abscesses, cellulitis, sinusitis, brain infections. It can become systemic and cause sepsis and even spread downward and have respiratory um, result in pneumonia. And there are often oral cancers in the older adult, which have a high mortality rate. So we really need to explore non-traditional dental settings for older adults to receive oral care. In 2011, six national professional organizations, medicine, dentistry, nursing, osteopathy, pharmacy, and public health, join together to develop the IPEC competencies. These are the interprofessional educational competencies, which declare that all health professionals have the same core competencies, and they are to learn and understand each other's roles and responsibilities, to respect each other's values and ethics, to communicate with each other, and to collaborate and work together as teams. And the goal of this interprofessional learning is to prepare all health professional students to work together with the common goal of building safer and better patient-centered care at decreased cost. We believe that oral health is the perfect exemplar for this interprofessional collaboration. In in response to the IOM recommendations, HRSA convened a panel in 2012 to develop oral health competencies for primary care, and they were released just this past April in 2014. The document is called the Integration of Oral Health into Primary Care Practice, and HRSA's um, the oral health competencies strive to improve access to early detection and prevention interventions by expanding the oral health clinical competency of primary care clinicians. So this document actually outlines what primary care clinicians can and should do. And they state that they need to be including oral health risk assessment in their history by asking simple questions about toothbrushing, diet, and fluoride. They need to do an oral physical exam looking at the teeth, gums, and mouth, and a bimanual exam for oral cancer. And they need to plan for preventive oral health care, teaching oral hygiene, tobacco sensation, 
tooth brushing, fluoride varnish, oral systemic connections, and they need to improve communication by collaborating with and referring to their dental colleagues. But many of the primary care providers need resources for this information. So Smiles for Life, I would highly recommend this as a resource. It is the nation's only comprehensive oral health curriculum designed to enhance the role of the primary care clinician in promoting oral health for all age groups through the development and dissemination of high-quality educational resources. Smiles for Life is an award-winning, free, web-based curriculum, and it provides eight modules on oral health topics, such as urgent care, pediatrics, prenatal, adult, geriatric, fluoride varnish, oral exam, and oral systemic connection. These modules can be completed online for CE credits. They can also be downloaded for educators to use in class with speaker note, case studies, and quizzes. And Smiles for Life also has pocket cards for bedside care and apps for electronic devices. I'd also recommend our website. It's called ONAP.org, and this is the Oral Health Nursing Education and Practice website. ONAP advocates, educates, creates, and promotes resources that primary care clinicians can use to improve the quality of oral health care in their patients. This is a great website for you to use as a knowledge center and a portal for best practices. So we believe that through our interprofessional approach, we can expand the oral health workforce, reduce disparities for our older adults, and improve oral health care for our patients, communities, and the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hartnett. Our next speaker for today is going to be Dr. Mark Wolf. Dr. Mark Wolf is professor and chair of the Department of Cariology and Comprehensive Care and associate dean for predoctoral clinical education at the New York University College of Dentistry. He has designed, developed, and implemented an extensive curriculum in caries risk assessment and has designed dental information systems to assist dental schools in monitoring the risk of the entire dental patient population. He was the founding counselor of the American Dental Education Association Cariology Section. Dr. Wolf has completed numerous international research and oral health assessments. Dr. Wolf, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Erin. So um, we're going to speak at this moment about some of the oral systemic connections uh, associated with oral diseases and, and their causation. So first I need to focus on what's the, what, what's the big problem of teeth and aging. The biggest problem is we are getting older and we're actually keeping our teeth, which is a wonderful item. But the teeth we're retaining have more extensive work already done on them, bridges, crowns, implants, an extensive amount of work. And the problem that comes is restoring these teeth becomes much more challenging. We cannot bond as easily. The, the teeth are more difficult to, to manage and work on, especially after having a, a large amount of work done on them. And then there are certain physiologic conditions that make natural healing less likely. We'll speak about those in a moment. The, the last of those is a personal issue that people may be having more dexterity problems maintaining and keeping their teeth clean. So we need to recognize that oral health, what we look like, what we feel like, and how we eat can have absolutely profound effects on, on all populations, young and old, but particularly our seniors. Uh, Oral problems are found very, very frequently in our seniors, and 7% of 65-year-olds complain about actually having had pain in their mouth over the last six months. 
the loss of teeth has a, a devastating effect on, on self-esteem, uh, overall ability to speak and quality of life, and then those actual items that we would expect that we're not able to eat as well, our diets shift to, to, to fattier foods, foods that are higher in carbohydrate and lead to other oral and systemic health problems. Seniors are struck with a tremendous amount of oral disease, and was, as was just mentioned, they're also confronted at the same time with a lack of financial resources frequently uh, to, to manage these diseases. And that becomes a significant in, I, issue when we realize that, that Medicare does not cover oral health issues and that um, these patients um, now have the, the issue of dealing with dental health privately as a self-pay item. Well, if you're, if you're near or below the poverty line, this becomes a very significant issue. We'll spend a few moments speaking about the actual physiologic conditions that take place. We all have a friend, a relative, who eats all sorts of sweets, may or may not brush their teeth as well, but never seems to get decay. And if there's somebody else in the family, or we may be that person ourselves, that, you know, we're constantly battling tooth decay and oral health and periodontal problems. And there are some real good reasons for this as we go through the process. Um, the first, uh, well, we only captured the second, sl second slide here. The accumulation of plaque on the outside of teeth doesn't necessarily govern whether or not we get decay. When we look at this particular individual, he has absolutely clean teeth. We can see that the gingiva, the gums are nice and pink, yet we can see these teeth are severely rotted. What happened? Quite simply, this was a patient that no matter how well they took care of their teeth, they continued to get decay. In this case, this is a patient that's had head-neck radiation for malignancy that's resulted in destruction of the salivary gland. Now, as it turns out, Tooth decay is not a one-direction item. Early 1900s, we believed you started with a cavity, uh, with decay, and it only progressed to cavitation. Today, we recognize that there are a few other spots that this can occur. We start with lesions very early, and they can develop to what we can conventionally call a cavity, a hole in the tooth, or that decay may be arrested, even if it's a hole in the tooth, it may turn black and have no activity and be able to last, particularly in our senior population, a lifetime. Or if we get these early lesions when they start out, we can actually reverse them and cure them. So if we look at a lesion like this, the white spot you see at the tip of the, uh, at the, at the gum line here, this is actually decay. There's no hole yet. The tooth has started to dissolve. And if we continue to allow plaque to build up there and we continue to feed the plaque the sugars that cause it to generate acids, eventually this tooth will cavitate and we will wind up losing tooth structure. This is actually a cross-sectional micrograph. We're in the middle. The, bra the, the black area you see there is actually the tooth having lost calcium, yet the surface stays intact. Now, what governs whether this occurs turns out to be a very complex matrix. So plaque, the debris that builds up on the outside of tooth, is one item. The quality of the tooth, whether it has fluoride or no fluoride in it, has another item to do with it. Sugar, how much and how frequently, we'll go over that in a moment, has something to do with it. But it's all captured inside saliva. And saliva turns out to be one of the giant mediators that determines whether we get caries, tooth decay in the middle. So let's start out talking about plaque. Plaque is this layer that forms on teeth, and even after we brush our teeth really well, there are areas that accumulate this plaque and hold it on the surface. What you see here is an ultraviolet photograph of plaque immediately after a patient brushed their teeth. They didn't do a great job on the bottom. But what you see outlined on the top is the nooks and crannies inside the teeth where the toothbrush didn't get there. Keep this plaque here. And this plaque is a, is a mixture of microbes. They're embedded inside a, a sticky substance that stays on the tooth surface, and they have a bunch of salivary polymers that are actually attached to that outer surface. And this is where the event actually occurs that determines whether we get 
tooth decay. Now, when we take sugar and add it to this biofilm, another name for plaque, the bacteria inside it eat the, eat the sugar, and what they do is they excrete acid. The acid sits inside this biofilm and slowly starts to dissolve enamel. Now, whether or not this gets neutralized or washed away is totally determined by saliva. That event determines whether or not we get decay. So this is a classic experiment from the 1940s, actually, where we take the, the pH of plaque, which is near neutral normally, we feed it a little bit of sugar, and within minutes, the plaque dives down and starts to demineralize the tooth, dissolve the tooth. The pH inside that plaque starts to become terrible, and what we call that is a critical pH Below 5.5, we start to dissolve the tooth. The longer we stay below this critical pH, the more likely we are to dissolve the tooth. As it turns out, if we take saliva away from the patient, instead of it taking 20 or 30 minutes to get back to neutrality, it takes anywhere up to three hours. And then if we add the complication of frequent eating, the more frequently we eat, or the more frequently we expose the sugar, the more rapid we see this demineralization occur. And in fact, what we're talking about here could just be a couple of teaspoons of sugar inside a cup of coffee that's sipped once every few minutes over two or three hours. Bacteria only need micrograms of this, this uh, carbohydrate to go ahead and create the acid. And when that occurs, the patient spends their entire time demineralizing the tooth, and eventually we get cavitation. Now, what are some of the things that might make this even worse? Well, as it turns out, dry mouth, having no saliva to neutralize these acids, and saliva neutralizes the acids in a few different methods with amino acids, washing away the acid, and the most prominent is the fact that it contains sodium bicarbonate. If we don't neutralize those acids, the patient starts dissolving their teeth more rapidly, just like that cancer patient, cancer survivor we saw a few moments ago. Now, xerostomia is interesting. We prescribe medications over and over to patients, particularly elderly patients, to make them stay healthy, and they absolutely should be taking these medications. But just about any of the antis, the antidepressants, antihistamines, antihypertensives, antianginals, diuretics, any of these particular drugs wind up causing us to have dry mouth. And when we do that, we need to think real carefully about whether or not we should be doing some sort of supplementation such as fluorides or other methods, seeing a dentist more frequently to help prevent tooth decay. We need these medications to prolong life, but at the same time we do this, we may take somebody that's been healthy all of their life, compromise them pretty brutally, and now leave them in a position that, that they no longer can, can heal and do well. And in fact, there are autoimmune diseases that do the same exact thing. When we recognize them, we need to recognize that we have no saliva. When we drop saliva, the patients wind up in a much greater chance of developing decay. Now, here's an example of root caries. It's caused by poor oral hygiene and feeding the foods. It's not caused just by aging. We see lots of root caries in adults. It can, be, uh, it can be arrested and dealt with with fluorides and other mechanisms to try and control it, but we need to recognize that. I'm going to switch tone at this moment and spend a few moments talking about periodontal disease. This plaque that you see accumulating at the top of the gum line here and that redness of the gums, that bleeding when you just touch it, is a sign of acute inflammation and a localized or even sometimes systemic inflammation and infection. So this can raise all of the body's immune mediators, all of the inflammatory mediators rise in the blood system associated with this exposure to plaque. We see increased risk of heart disease. In many cases, we believe this may be related or it's at least a comorbidity. And even worse, we see lots of respiratory infections in patients that we allow this disease to, come, to exist in. Very difficult to cure or eliminate in our senior citizen we should do this much earlier in patients, but we can't leave this plaque here. It has untoward and terrible effects um, in the future. 
Periodontal disease can result in tooth loss, pain, infection, and severe conditions. It also um, is made worse by smoking, uncontrolled diabetes, and having a family history of um, periodontal disease. Oral cancer is something that we need to be aware of and check. Approximately 7,000 seniors die each year of oral cancer. We need to examine under the tongue and around the area to go ahead and look for signs of lesions that need attention. Treatment and early intervention in these lesions can manage to eliminate the problem or at least sustain and extend life. We need to educate. We need a large team of people educating the population on how to prevent oral cancers, oral health issues, um, and caries, and bring a larger team to this rather than dentists alone. I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our next present, uh, presenter is Dr. Caroline Dorson. She has been practicing as an FNP in underserved communities for over 15 years and is a full-time faculty member at NYU College of Nursing for a decade. She is a highly sought-after speaker at national and international conferences, mostly on topics related to health disparities and the care of vulnerable populations. She has spoken at multiple conferences on the topic of oral health, including at the Institute of Medicine workshop on expanding the oral health care workforce. Dr. Dorson, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, and thank you to the speakers who have gone before me for setting such a nice stage for me to talk about integrating um, the new HRSA competencies into the primary care workforce. And I'd like to start just by taking one minute to think about globally sort of where we are and our speakers before me um, have said all of this, but just to summarize it, we have woken up to the fact that oral health is an important part of overall health. And this, of course, was not always true, and that Surgeon General report that Dr. Hartnett um, spoke about earlier in our talk was really a change moment in the history of how we think about oral health as part of the health of people's bodies and the health of their minds. So we've learned that oral health is important. We have a growing um, aging population with more um, oral health complaints and more serious oral health concerns. And at the same time, we have access issues, including insurance, as my um, other speakers have spoken about, but also the fact that we don't have enough people on the front lines providing oral health care to our patients. So what does this mean for nurses? So I just want to start by talking about um, the limited research that we have on what nurses know about oral health and their inclusion of oral health in their clinical practice. And again, I want to make sure everyone is aware that there's a very, very small amount of literature in this area, um, so we are really in need of people to do research. But what we do know is that this is a neglected topic in professional education for nurses. And certainly, anecdotally, when I go and I give talks on oral health to nurses, I ask how many nurses in the room received any oral health education while they were either in their RN training or their NP training, and usually only a handful of people will raise their hand. What does the research say? There's one uh, study that has been done. It was done by Hein and all in 2011. And what this research suggested is that faculty think that this is really important, um, but they are, have no time to put this into their curriculum. They have a lack of experience and a lack of knowledge, and thus are not really talking about oral health, either as it relates to oral systemic health or the specifics of how to do an oral health exam with their RN and their NP students. As far as I know, there has not been a study looking specifically at geriatric content, so we really have no idea at this point how much information regarding the special oral health needs of older adults is being included in baccalaureate, master's, or doctoral nursing education. Um, how much do nurses actually do oral health exam and oral health education in clinical practice? Um, again, there's not a whole lot of information out there, but Van de Vander et al. did a study in 2011 where they spoke to um, a good number of home care nurses in the New York City area, um, and these are all nurses who are working with patients with HIV AIDS, and what they found is that the nurses felt very confident that they were able to assess oral health, and uh, many of them, the majority, said that they actually were assessing oral health. 
And when we looked at the study, the results, we were really confused because we thought to ourselves, we have all of these nurses who are saying that they're doing this and who are feeling confident, but these same nurses are raising their hands and saying that they've really had no content in this area. So a number of us are really trying to increase the amount of oral health content in our teaching. Um, but the question has always been, what is within the scope of practice for nurses and nurse practitioners when it comes to oral health? And there has not been an answer until now. With the um, implementation of the HRSA Oral Health Core Competency Domains, we've really gotten a nice guidebook to help us think about what we should be doing in primary care regarding oral health as nurses and nurse practitioners. And the overarching concept of this paper, um, and it's really worthwhile looking at it, it's a free download, I encourage everyone to go and take a look at it, is that primary care is really the safety net of oral health care meaning that we may not have the answers to all of the complex oral health problems that our patients present with, and I think Dr. Wolf's presentation showed us that these are um, very complicated issues and that there is a wide variety of issues that can be going on both intraorally and extraorally in our geriatric patients. Um, so we may not have all the answers, but we should be thinking about oral health and we should be referring and collaborating with our oral health colleagues. So they came up with five domains um, for primary care providers to be thinking about, and these are risk assessment regarding oral health, oral health evaluation, preventive interventions, communication and education, and interprofessional collaboration. And I'm going to go through each of those five domains in a moment. Although I first want to just mention, while well, we've sort of taken all of this um, at NYU, at NYU, we think about this as um, that classic, what we always say, everyone needs knowledge regarding something, skills regarding whatever it is, and an attitude um, that helps um, preserve um, the sanctity of what we're doing. And regarding oral health, we feel that nurses and nurse practitioners really need to understand the evidence related to oral systemic health. So not only think about the oral health problems that might be indicators of systemic health problems, but also in that bidirectional relationship where we think about what oral health problems um, are making our systemic health problems worse and vice versa. They also need to know the basic oral manifestations of chronic diseases. So understanding that diabetes may present with severe periodontal disease. In terms of skills, we want our nurses and nurse practitioners to be able to take an appropriate health history regarding oral health, to know the oral health risk factors and the chronic disease implications um, of oral health problems. Regarding attitude, oh, and I'm sorry, I just want to mention being able to perform a good intraoral, meaning in the mouth, and extraoral around the mouth exam, and that's inclusive of the lips and lymph node structures. Regarding attitudes, one of the things that we have found interesting here at NYU is that a lot of nurses find this interesting, um, but they're not sure, again, how it relates to their clinical practice. And as we speak more and more about this intricate oral systemic health connection, what we're seeing is that nurses are really understanding the importance of speaking to their patients about oral health, about doing good oral health exams, and about doing good oral health education. So we've really had an attitude shift as it relates to oral health. I want to mention that we have um, changed our approach to doing a H-E-E-N-T exam at NYU, and we're encouraging all of you to stop thinking about the exam of the head and neck as a H-E-E-N-T exam, but rather to change it to the HE-NOT exam. And the concept here is that you cannot omit oral health from the HE-NOT exam. And our goal here is to teach um, students and practicing RNs and NPs to think about oral health as part of systemic health, to think about it as a health maintenance opportunity, and again, to think about the special issues across the lifespan. So to think about um, children, to think about uh, adults, and to think about older adults. But let's get back um, to the oral health competencies as outlined by HRSA. And the first is risk assessment. HRSA is encouraging non-oral health care providers, so nurses and nurse practitioners, to conduct oral health risk assessments, to think about the medical and psychological conditions that may impact oral health. And I think a great example is the example that Dr. Wolf gave us of xerostomia and thinking about polypharmacy in our geriatric patients 
they encourage us to think about oral health conditions that may impact medical and psychological health. Another example that Dr. Wolf gave us is the impact that simply decay can have on a person's well-being as well as their ability to communicate um, and to properly um, have nutrition. Lastly, we want people to think about the epidemiology of oral health conditions. The second domain is regarding oral health evaluation, and this is where we're encouraging practicing nurses and nurse practitioners to be able to take a focused oral health history. So to think about what questions are most important in a comprehensive visit where you're thinking about everything top to bottom, um, head to toe in our patients, but also in that focused visit. What do you want to ask a patient with diabetes regarding oral health? What questions are important to ask if a patient comes in who's complaining of um, decay of their teeth or complaining of halitosis or complaining of tooth pain? We also want our, our students and our fellow nurse colleagues to be able to do a focused oral health exam, and I refer you back to the Smiles for Life modules. They are fantastic. They will show you in clear terms exactly how to do both the intra and extra oral health exam, um, and I encourage you to especially um, to look at the modules 1, 7, and 8 that cover not only the oral systemic health connection and the basic HENOT exam, but also the special issues for our older adults. In Domain 3, HRSA recommends that we think about our preventive interventions and to include oral health risk as part of our preventive health activities. So again, to think about that oral systemic risk, to think about smoking not just as a risk factor for heart disease and lung disease, but also to think about tobacco use in all forms as a risk for oral cancer and to educate our patients accordingly. In Domain 4, HRSA is recommending that we think beyond the individual level and actually think about population level education regarding the link between oral and systemic health. So for those of you who are out there who speak um, locally, nationally, internationally, for people who do community lectures, for people who work in health fairs, this is the opportunity that you have to start talking to our patients as, about oral health as part of their overall health and to really get them thinking um, at the population level. So what do we need to be doing, not just with the patient who's sitting um, with us in our office, but again, thinking about our community and what specific risk factors may or may not exist in the communities within w which we work. Lastly, HRSA is encouraging us to work um, more appropriately and more thoroughly with our interprofessional colleagues. And this is something that I really can't emphasize enough. I always tell my students that I can count on one hand the number of times when I was in clinical practice before I started doing oral health work that I actually picked up the phone and talked to one of my dental colleagues. And I can tell you in 10 or 15 years of practice, it was two or three times that I spoke to a dentist on the phone. Now I speak to dentists all the time because I really understand the value that they bring to the table in thinking about the care of the patient from a more holistic perspective. Another example of this is collaborative care, so not just the times that you pick up the phone and call your colleague, but also the times that you need to co-manage a patient. So the question that I am going to throw out, and I'm going to end in just one minute, is just to think about what does all of this mean? How do we incorporate these competencies and these changes into practice? And certainly with our current students, we can do a whole lot of work, and we introduce this in our advanced health assessment class. We have them do cases. We have them learn the exam. We do tons of assignments. They write notes. But what do we do for nurses and NPs who are currently in practice? How do we change their practice to include oral health to get the word out there that this is an important aspect of healthcare for all patients? And this is where we need to really start thinking outside of the box. It is no longer enough just to sit side and say, you know, have you been to a dentist and to end the conversation there. We now need to really try and challenge ourselves and each other to think about oral health from the systemic perspective and from a global perspective in order to treat our patients um, with the quality care that we hope to give them. With that, I will end and pass this on to my colleague um, in the South. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Dorson. Our next speaker is Dr. Rita Jablonski-Judon. She is an established researcher in the area of oral health and persons with dementia. She practices in the Mem Memory Disorders Clinic at the Kirkland Clinic. She is an associate professor and teaches across programs at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Nursing. Doctor, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to talk about 
Canberra, we're going to talk about a way that nurse practitioners and other people involved in primary care can manage caries using a risk assessment protocol. So CAMBRA stands for Caries Management by Risk Assessment. It was pioneered at the UCSF School of Dentistry, and it's an evidence-based method for assessing caries risk using a combination of behavioral, chemically, chemical, and minimally invasive restorative procedures that you individualize for each patient. The risk assessment weighs both the factors, the risk factors, and the protective factors, much like a seesaw. If the protective factors outweigh the risk factors, the patient is instructed to continue engaging in these positive behaviors. However, if the risk factors outweigh the protective factors, then a course of action is developed, both independently and in collaborative with dental professionals. So, the risk factors, those with an asterisk, are the ones that pay, place your patient at a higher risk for caries, and the remainder are moderate risk factors. So some of the things you're going to look at during your exam, you're going to look for visible heavy plaque on teeth. You're going to ask your patient if they've had any restorative work done in the last three years. During the review of the systems, you can ask about how often they snack or consume sugary drinks. Also, you want to look and see if there are deep pits and fissures. This is early demineralization that shows up as enamel defects, such as white lines near the gingival margins. As the enamel erodes, yellow spots can also appear as the underlying dentin is exposed. Cavitations appear as pits. Excellent pictures of these changes can be found on the Smiles for Life curriculum. Additional risk factors also include recreational drug use, a report of dry mouth, or if you can observe that the mouth is very dry, if you see exposed roots, which as people age, the, the gingiva tend to recede, and also the use of any orthodontic appliances also places your patient at a higher risk for caries. The protective factors that you want to find out if they are existing for your patient include access to fluoridated water. Usually this is assumed if people live in communities served by fluoridated water, but if your patient drinks predominantly bottled water or commercial liquids such as diet soda or sports drinks, he or she may not be reaping the benefits of fluoridated water. Also, the use of fluoridated products. Most commercial toothpastes have sodium fluoride in the amount of 1,100 to 1,400 parts per million. Prescription fluoride contains 5,000 parts per million. Over-the-counter mouth rinses contain about a half a percent of sodium fluoride. Other protective factors include the use of topical fluoride applications within the past six months, for example, fluoride varnish. You need to determine if your patient is using chlorhexidine gluconate, which is a strong antibacterial agent, which also has protective factors. And last but not least, and this is critical with older adults, saliva is an important piece, as my colleagues have already discussed, because it contains proteins, lipids, calcium, and phosphate that contribute to protect teeth and repair early lesions caused by demineralization. So the next question is, how does one use CAMBRA? Well, remember the seesaw? CAMBRA involves assessing the risk by taking into account all the pathological factors and protective factors. The more risk factors outweigh the protective factors, the greater the caries risk. The level of risk dictates how one proceeds next. Behavioral changes, such as promoting twice daily toothbrushing with over-the-counter products containing fluoride are, are, are um, emphasized, as well as once daily flossing, avoiding carbohydrate-rich foods and snacks, and all of these are the cornerstone of good oral hygiene regardless of risk level. The use of therapeutic agents, however, depend on the level of risk. So for folks who are low risk, and these are people with a lot of protective factors and very few risk factors, you want to reinforce the positive 
health promotion behaviors of twice daily brushing, using over-the-counter fluoride containing toothpaste, and sometimes this can be an issue with older adults who may want to use things like straight baking soda or other types of preparations that do not contain fluoride. For individuals that you determine to be at a moderate risk, you need to, it, it, it's very helpful to refer to a dental professional, but if an appointment cannot be obtained immediately, the nurse practitioner can prescribe a caries reducing regimen in the interval, and of course this would have to be in accordance with your state guidelines. But the first thing to emphasize is they need to brush twice a day with a fluoride toothpaste. They should rinse with chlorhexidine gluconate, 10 mils, seven days out of a 30-day period. Chlorhexidine is a potent antibacterial agent and must be prescribed. It can discolor enamel, dentin, and restorative surfaces such as crowns, but this discoloration is normally seen when patients are unable to brush for example, due to surgery or sutures. And because the patients follow this protocol, continue to brush, this coloration may not be an issue. For the remaining 21 days, have the patient rinse with an over-the-counter solution of half a percent of sodium fluoride twice a day after brushing. You should have your patient use this regimen for six months with an evaluation at the end of that time by a dental professional to see if the risk for caries to see if the risk for caries has shown some improvement. And for folks with uh, high risk or severe risk, these are people with predominant risk factors but few protective. If hyposalivation is present, these people move to extreme risk. This is where collaboration and referral to a dental professional is really important. If you cannot obtain an appointment, and this was something I ran into with my practice in Pennsylvania, I worked in an indigent care clinic, and we did have dentists who worked next door. And it was really nice to just walk across the hallway and have a consult. But we had a one-year waiting list. So there were times we would start the process and then work the patients in as best as we could. But one option, and this is a bit of an issue with older adults, is fluoride varnish. It is the standard of care for pediatric patients, and it is reimbursed by Medicaid, and nurse practitioners can be reimbursed for this for pediatric patients in about 40 states. For older adults, this is not quite the standard of care, nor is it reimbursed. Now, fluoride varnish has been used safely in Europe since the 1970s. It was approved in the United States in 1994 for tooth sensitivity and to be applied for cavity linings. Only recently in 2006 has it been used and approved in the United States for caries prevention. And one of my dreams is to look at some research projects where we look at fluoride varnish in older adults and I can see what the outcomes are. But that's something down in the, the future that I'll be working with the dentists on my research team. Chlorhexidine rinse should also be used 10 mils a day for seven days. And at this point, prescription fluoride needs to come into play. And that would be used twice a day. And the follow-up is, is a lot briefer. It's within four months. I have some resources, the Canberra, more information about Canberra can be found on this site. And again, I know everyone has talked about the Smiles for Life curricula. I can't say enough positive things about it. We use it for our undergrads and for our nurse practitioner students at UAB. Another great site is the Oral Health Nursing Education and Practice website. Some tremendous resources there. So at this point, I'd like to turn it back to Carrie. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. We are now going to take some of your questions. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A tab on the top of your screen and then select Ask New Question. Our first question today is, dry mouth increases risk for caries. Does dry mouth also increase a person's risk for gum disease? Um. 
So this is Mark. I'll answer that. Um, it actually does not. The different flora um, with a different, actually, series of nutrients. It's not even sugar does not feed the bacteria that cause gum disease. Uh, so they have almost totally different uh, mechanisms. There are a lot of anaerobic bacteria, very, very noxious um, excrements that cause all this inflammation, causes an elevation of, of our collagenase, elastase, um, gelatinase that causes this tissue dis destruction and rapid friability of the tissue that causes the bleeding. We see all the immune mediators rise almost immediately in the patient. And our next question is, has a link been established between gum disease and Alzheimer's? I'll take that one also. Um, as it turns out, it has been looked at. There are a series of comorbidities. It appears that um, whether it's, it's periodontal disease uh, is in high rates in patients that don't take good care of their teeth and can't manipulate uh, or whether, whether we have large amounts of inflammation uh, present. It appears that it's much more a comorbidity than a cause and effect. And I'd like to weigh in, too. This is Rita Jablonski-Judon. As dementia increases, care-resistant behavior also increases. And in my work in long-term care, we see a lot of situations where the nursing assistants do not even attempt to brush teeth because the person with dementia will refuse or reject care. And they're real concerned about patients' rights and autonomy, but they don't realize that the person with dementia is not exercising autonomy, but is responding to the perceived threat of mouth care. And that continues to be a real important issue in long-term care. And for an adult with Alzheimer's, would you recommend fluoride varnish to be done in the early stage of the disease? So there's, there's a good deal of discussion about dependency rather than just Alzheimer's. Let's say any time somebody is losing their independence, their ability to do feeding, shopping, brushing, activities of daily living themselves for any disease, we should start thinking about what's happening with the teeth in, in, a, in a more long-term effect. Um, fluoride varnish is probably the most aggressive, most tested, and most effective method of reducing tooth decay. Um, chlorhexidine uh, either varnishes or rinses, depending, um, particularly in periodontal disease, have been shown to be effective. It's, it's actually a little equivocal in, in caries. As a matter of fact, there are a number of national and international physician papers that don't advocate uh, chlorhexidine for caries. Um, it's... It's um, certainly the time to intercede on patients is early, not later. And if patients do not have their natural teeth, should they see a dentist every six months? There's certainly oral cancer risk. Um, there's certainly sores that occur underneath dentures and other activities. So I wouldn't say every six months becomes the key, um, they should have at least an annual oral exam that can be done by a primary care provider looking for sore spots, asking are they able to eat well, and then looking at the tissue itself to determine that there's no evidence of change in the mucosal look. I think you need some training in how to do it, but once, once any primary care provider receives it, um, then, you know, they're ready to go. Our next question is, if a client has a problem with fluoride use, is it appropriate to recommend xylitol? Uh, an incredibly great question. Um, so xylitol uh, has had a mixed research bag as far as its effectiveness or non-effectiveness. The first thing we need to know is that you need, in, in children, it's been shown to have some moderate effect. At, at 6 to 10 milligrams of, of xylitol per day, we need to understand that it can cause diarrhea and loose stool and, and some other problems when we start to get to very large doses 
of, of xylitol per day. Um, so if we ask about our highest risk patients, those oral cancer patients, those absolutely dry mouth patients, uh, xylitol lozenges, lollipops, and, and chewing gums, we do use them fairly heavily in our highest risk patients. It certainly shouldn't be considered a substitute for a better outcome tested fluor fluoride varnish, for instance. Our next question is, what challenges have been seen with physician groups that are admitting patients into the hospitals? And secondly, are oral health issues contributing to and masking other disease processes? Um, so, with... The, 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 as, a, as a dentist who's admitted to hospitals, it's been much more difficult for the dentist to make admissions to hospitals for patients with medically complex care than it is for a physician to. Oral examinations are not typically part of that process, um, so that's, a, that's a, a different situation. In most hospitals that are not tertiary care hospitals, it's actually um, not likely that there's even... Uh, you know, there, there will be oral surgeons on staff. General dentists are not on staff in lots of community hospitals. So that's a, a significant um, issue. I, I think I answered that particular question. Um, are there oral health issues contributing to and masking other diseases? Um, I don't know. Um, the, uh, so the answers are, the, the thing that, that is our classic example, and it, it dates back, uh, you know, I, I remember an occurrence when I was a resident many years ago, a patient coming in for what was being cultured for a sore throat, big rest posterior throat, that when, our, when we picked up the tongue and looked under, underneath it, it was um, squamous cell carcinoma that had already spread to the, the bone and taken away a good deal of, of the, the side of the tongue, and the patient actually expired before I completed my residency. So can oral, oral diseases can present and create issues. Um, diabetes is a great example. It's, it's another one of these diseases where you might not be able to make the diabetes better by cleaning the teeth, but diabetes is very hard to control in the presence of uncontrolled infection and inflammation. So one is affecting the other in, in very significant fashions. And no one has mentioned flossing as a prevention. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, so flossing has never been shown to be effective in preventing tooth decay. I know that's a shock. Brushing with fluoride toothpaste has, brushing without fluoride toothpaste actually has not. And that, both of those items are related to the fact that micro-thin biofilms, plaque layers, are all we need to create decay. So that's a real serious issue. We need to put a medication, a method of cleansing using a toothpaste with fluoride on it. That makes a difference. We don't do that with flossing. So um, flossing does not affect uh, tooth decay. It actually does reduce gingivitis, uh, inflammation of the gums. Um, its correlation to treatment of, of periodontitis, the more serious deep pocketing where teeth start getting loose, not as strong there. That's because the disease is much deeper inside the pocket. Is amalgam harmful to human health? Is it linked to dementia? And what is the safest way to remove it? A controversial discussion, but in the in the in the real um, uh, scientific literature that actually looks at, at at combinations and health outcomes, it's never been shown to to be associated with any disease, um, except in the very rare patient that's truly allergic to one of the components in amalgam. For those that don't know, amalgam is a mixture. To amalgamate means to mix with mercury, um, silver fillings. Are, um, are silver, copper, zinc, um, and, and some other, sometimes indium, some others, and 
Um, mercury, which is mixed together, hardens. The vast majority of the mercury is captured inside the amalgam, that silver filling as we call it. Um, it hardens, stays in place. A small amount of that mercury may be released by brushing, abrasion, or the exposure to heat. Um, it's never been shown to be a, a um, health issue. Removal of amalgam, if you're concerned about the amount of mercury, when you physically cut the amalgam, you actually cause the release of mercury. You generate heat. The mercury is actually released. Blood mercury levels are higher in patients as we actually remove amalgams than they are when we leave them alone. They need to be removed under what we call a rubber dam, a sheet of rubber that protects the from the, the components being inhaled. Uh, they need to be done with copious water to keep it cool. They need to be suctioned rapidly to take it out and to remove. Um, I would not recommend remo well, I, the American Dental Association and all the literature does not recommend the removal of amalgam for the purpose of curing or treating any specific disease because none has been found to be effective in that respect. Um, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of internet buzz on, on events and things, and I'm sure I'll, I'll suck down a bunch of communications associated with it, but the science just isn't there to, to show that amalgam is an elevated risk. That being said, at a school like NYU, we do not principally place amalgams. We use non-amalgam restoratives when we make our choice, but we don't remove intact and functioning amalgams. And how long do fluoride treatments last? That's, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, so how long is a elevated mercury, elevated mercury, I'm sorry, elevated fluoride in the mouth um, around the outside of the tooth is about 24, 48 hours. It actually depends on the amount of challenge and the amount of risk associated. So uh, there's been a, a series of, of very good uh, um, double-blind placebo-controlled studies that show in high-risk individuals doing fluoride treatments every three months or four times a year um, reduce the tooth decay by almost 80%. Um, we've conducted them on mass with, with teachers and, and dental assistants applying the fluorides in, in a country like Grenada. Uh, in children, and we reduce tooth decay 80% in that population. So you can have um, lay public that are trained. You can, have, you can have nurse practitioners. Three, four applications a year really do its best job in cutting down tooth decay. The effects of last, I don't like to say that because that, would, that gives the implication of how long does the fluoride hang out there. The fluoride is actually has to be incorporated in the tooth to make the difference, and that happens in the first 24, 48, 72 hours after we apply the fluoride varnish. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. That's all the time we have for questions today. On Oops. behalf of Niche, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today and for your participation. I would also like to thank our speakers for their excellent presentations. When done with the webinar, please be sure to complete the evaluation located in the Niche Knowledge Center. The evaluation is necessary for you to receive your certificate. Also, if you have additional users participating in the webinar who do not have accounts in the Knowledge Center and did not individually register for this webinar that still need their CEU certificate, please send the name of all participants, including their email addresses, the name of the webinar, and the name of the hospital to support at nicheprogram.org. Again, that is support at nicheprogram.org. The users will then be added to the Knowledge Center and prompted to take the evaluation to obtain their certificates. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you all have a great afternoon. You may now disconnect. <laughs>